Thank you very much for your kind invitation to uh, attend this evening. Um, Dr. Buckbury and myself are um, presenting on what is a very interdisciplinary project and um, we have to give thanks to your collections manager, Anushka Rawdon, who um, formerly of Ch Ch Chichester District Council's Novium, um, was actually present as part of our pilot project, but more from Joe in a moment uh, about uh, aspects there. We're talking to you about a project that is founded on um, the discipline of biological anthropology initially. Um, and within that discipline, we have the traditional resources at our disposal for the teaching of our students. Uh, the sort of textbooks that you see here, the very learned textbooks, the likes of uh, these textbook, um, The Identification of Pathological Conditions by Don Orr, um, who uh, was a long-standing visitor in Bradford and in whose name, sadly, we, we dedicate this resource because he passed away at the very outset of the project. It is... Um, in recognition of the fact that these resources really only show a part of the information that our students um, can, uh, can actually grasp. So the photographs and the line drawings only show part of what they need to, uh, to learn from. Of course, we're very lucky in Bradford in being the largest collection in any academic uh, archaeology department in the UK of uh, osteological uh, material. We have more than 4,000 skeletons. Contrast that with the teaching of biological anthropology in the States, where of course they have the limitations on them through NAGPRA in curating such collections. So you start to see the, the, the raison d'etre for the sort of project. Now we've been asked this evening, is it any one period that we're focused on? Our collections span the Neolithic through the mid-19th century. So we, we are not specific to any one period. What this project was about was looking at the type specimens that give the information about chronic pathological conditions affecting the skeleton. Most of the material is in partnership and collaboration with other institutions, museums such as the Novium, as I mentioned. And we run a dedicated MSc in Human Osteology and Paleopathology, and we've run short courses focused on this expertise that we have in Bradford based around these collections uh, of pathological conditions. And uh, more broadly speaking, and we'll return to this, we, we have uh, done various outreach events um, to schools and uh, the wider public. But, uh, oh, showed you there what our collections used to look like. Um, as a, in part, in uh, a recognition of this project, our dean, who's an anatomist by training, has actually very much got behind us. And so there's been a lot of reinvestment uh, in our department and in the collections themselves. So this is our shiny new store um, that uh, Joe manages. For me, though, the project um, and the, the, genesis of the genesis of the project began when I attended a conference in Colonial Williamsburg back in 1999. And we presented a couple of papers there, recognising the value of these collections, but also recognising the fragility of that material and how we might, uh, in the future, wish to... Um, uh, do the right thing by these collections in, in uh, safeguarding them. Move forward to 2010, some 11 years later, and the technology was catching up with that idea. Back to the future. And of course, um, uh, we were very lucky uh, at uh, that point in um, attracting funding from JISC, the, as you see here, the UK's expert in digital technologies for education and research. And we ran a pilot project around the material that Anushka was curating, 
um, uh, the archives, the physical archive of, and we held the skeletons in, in our care for them. It's the material from um, St Mary and uh, St James um, at Chichester, a medieval leprosarium. Originally, the monograph identified some 75 individuals with leprous change. Because we've been able to ex explore that collection in far more detail, looking at that material in a very different way, using 3D technologies, we've actually extended that to some 84 individuals. We've also got a collection uh, of historic radiographs, clinical radiographs of, of, um, uh, uh, of patients, um, modern patients um, from the 1970s, from India, from Africa, um, that uh, were exposed to those chronic changes of leprosy, and we curate those. That's the Joss Anderson archive, but as part of that project, we were able to tackle that. But more from Joe on that shortly. That was a pilot that showed JISC that we were capable of working with those 3D, with that content, using 3D digitization methods to actually do the right thing by the collection in digitally documenting the type specimens. There was only one other um, project, the British Geological Society's uh, GB3D type fossils project that was funded, that was working again in that 3D environment. Of course, as a visual subject, it's a logical next step for us. So we were lucky enough to secure, uh, in fact, if you add the University of Bradford's contribution, it's just short of a million pounds worth of public monies to safeguard the type specimens for use, not just in teaching biological anthropologists and osteoarchaeologists, but also using that material for the benefit of, of uh, training clinicians and medical historians but focused on the examples of chronic disease affecting the skeleton for which many of the physical changes are not even readily observable within clinical practice. Something, therefore, that um, has that extended reach across disciplines. And we were able, with our partners, and Joe will uh, explain this um, in terms of the partners, the Royal College of Surgeons and Museum of London Archaeology. So over to Joe. Okay, so um, one of the things that we did with um, From Cemetery to Clinic was create 3D models of um, different bones from individuals suffering from leprosy and making them available over the internet. And we wanted to take this further. We're aware that particularly in teaching but also in research, most of the sources that we have to help us with our diagnosis of diseases in the past are 2D images. But the lesions that we're looking at and the bones that they're on are extremely three-dimensional. So we wanted to take that further and digitize um, as many different elements as we could that really characterize the typical changes of as many different diseases as we could cover. Um, so we worked in partner with Museum of London Archaeology and the Royal College of Surgeons to basically get as many archaeological and historical examples of different pathologies, digitise them and make them widely available across the world. The reason we actually focused on the pathological um, specimens is because in terms of human skeletal remains, those bones are often the most fragile. Um, because um, the different pathological processes can weaken bone, um, they are much more susceptible to damage during excavation, during storage, and particularly during handling, either by students learning from them or by researchers coming to access them. Of course, because they're pathological, to many individuals, they were also regarded as the most interesting. So individuals like the, uh, those from Chichester, which was known as a leprosarium, attracted a half, far higher number of researchers coming to access those collections and therefore increasing that rate of damage. So what we wanted to do was preserve them in some way and make them much more widely available. 
Um, so we drew on all of our collections for the three project partners. So at the Biological Anthropology Research Centre, or the BARC, because that's less of a mouthful, um, we curate um, over 4,000 individuals. Um, as Andy said, they date from the Neolithic right the way through to the 19th century, although the bulk of our collections date to the Romano-British period and later. Um, key collections within there is St James and St Mary Magdalene at Chichester, the medieval leprosarium. It later became an almshouse, at which point we're seeing a much wider variety of pathologies present in those skeletons. As I was discussing earlier with, with a couple of fellows, we also curate 36 individuals who died at the Battle of Towton on Palm Sunday in 1461, reputedly the bloodiest battle fought on British soil. Um, Hereford Cathedral, we curate over 1,200 individuals, um, dating from the, the entire duration of the medieval period, but significantly they include a large plague pit with um, Yasina pestis being identified through ancient DNA analysis securing that diagnosis of, of, well, identification of the plague because the plague doesn't affect the skeletons. You, you, you can't look for the direct evidence. And the Royal College of Surgeons here in London has got two, two <coughs> major collections of human um, remains um, in the Hunterian Museum and also the um, Welcome Museum. Um, and over 50,000 objects are recorded there from human remains through to, to notebooks and, and artefacts. Um, and we're really delighted to be able to work with both of those examples, significantly because a lot of them are um, from a period when diagnosis was um, much more refined, particularly for the modern material, but where we actually have a known diagnosis that is done on people whilst they're still living. One of the complications of paleopathology is that we don't know how somebody was feeling when they were ill, we just know what their, books, their bones look like after they died, which adds some confusion and complications into our diagnosis. So not only does the Royal College of Surgeons curate a large number of, indi of um, individual specimens of extremely rare conditions, but they also have known documented cases where we can say for certain what that pathology was, rather than it becoming an interpretation based on what we can see. Our third project partner was the Museum um, of London Archaeology. Um, over the years, they've excavated over 17,000 individuals from London. Um, when we started the project, um, they were part of the Museum of London and it's sort of decoupled um, over the duration of the project. But we worked extremely closely with the Centre for Human Bioarchaeology at the Museum of London, who are one of our lead associate partners in the project. And together they used the, the Word database, the Welcome Osteological Research database, to record all of that material and make that available to researchers from around the world, but in this case, without 3D images, just with the information about those remains. Of course, from the outset, we had to think about how we were actually going to present this to the public. So we decided the best thing we could do, in terms of a website that was going to be made available, is to actually come up with a way of grouping things together. So we had to try and classify our diseases. There's actually ended up being one of the more problematic aspects of it because basically from the outset we couldn't really agree on what we were going to do. Um, we had a wide ranging advisory panel from medical clinicians, um, paleopathologists and archaeologists all working together trying to come to a consensus and eventually we decided to go for something that was bespoke to our project because we needed something that divided material up enough that you could actually use it to navigate for a website. And we tried to focus on the underlying cause of a disease. Are we looking at an infection? If we are looking at an infection, is it a bacterial infection? Is that bacterial infection specific? We know which pathogen caused it. Or is it an infection that could have been caused by a number of different pathogens? So we ended up with a tiered system, which we developed into um, the, the navigation menu on the website. Um, so overall, we have anything up to four levels of classification in there. Um, and you use this to, to navigate around the website. And at each of these levels, we have something known as a clinical synopsis, which basically summarises what the disease is about, how it might affect an, in affect an individual, um, how we might see it on a skeleton. And then you can drill down to look at specific examples and read text that describe a specific bone and then also see the 3D image and potentially also a radiograph of specific bones for each of the categories. Another challenge was deciding exactly what we were going to scan. Um, so essentially we started with the material we actually use for teaching on the basis that if we're using it for teaching, it's got to be a really great example um, of what we're talking about. 
Um, so we worked through our teaching lists, identifying as much material as we can. And as we went along, we were finding more and more pathologies that we could add in, which was fantastic. Um, we worked with um, a number of postdocs, so um, Rebecca, who's in, in the bottom corner, um, was writing those pathological descriptions, whereas Emma at the top was very, very busy helping us work out exactly which bones we were going to include. She actually took photographs of everything so we could rapidly pick what we wanted to do in project meetings and was also very, very active promoting the project through social media. Um, so yeah, so Emma took these extremely fast photographs of everything and we graded each one on a category of A, brilliant, we'll have that, B, it's quite good, we may use that, down to X, which was actually it's not right for this project. Either the material itself was too fragmented, so it would become unrecognisable um, really to people who weren't used to working with it, or it's an example of a pathology but it isn't typical or isn't extreme enough to include. Um, and then finally, we also tried to think about how hard was this going to be to scan? And this was very much a steep learning curve for all of us um, because we weren't sure what was going to scan successfully at the outset of the project. And we learned as the project continued that extremely large and complicated specimens caused quite a significant problem in terms of computing power, um, whereas smaller ones you could scan quite quickly, but we needed to get the balance right between those different areas. So we worked very, very closely with our project um, um, associate, sorry, our project partners down in London. Um, basically, they were focusing on, on the pathologies that we didn't have in Bradford because they were working alongside us at the same time. They had access to larger collections, so they were focusing on the things where we knew we didn't have an example of, for example, Ostia Malaysia in the Bradford collection. And in particular, the Royal College of Surgeons could offer us extremely unusual pathological cases and those with a documented case history, which is very, very useful. Whereas the bulk of the material we scanned was either curated in Bradford or with our, um, either of the project partners in London, we worked alongside a significant number of museums and um, that we became known as associate partners. Um, some of these, such as the Novium and Gloucester City Museum, actually have material on long-term loan to, for, to us in Bradford, so it's curated in Bradford on behalf of those institutions. But other um, institutions we approached because we knew they had really fantastic examples of particular pathologies that we wanted to include within that. And we were delighted that they all agreed for us to scan the material and include it on what is basically a free access resource. Um, most significantly of those, the Museum of London contributed an enormous amount of data um, to the project and we really do appreciate everything that these groups did. One of the things that we learnt as we went along was that actually not only were we creating a resource for other people to learn from, but we were learning from the project as we went along. By carefully looking at all of these different cases, again, with a different set of eyes, with a different question in our mind, we were beginning to identify um, further expressions of disease on the bones or um, revisit our diagnosis and perhaps go, do you know what, I think the original diagnosis from 20 years ago, I think our knowledge has moved on and perhaps it's something different. So we're re-diagnosing things. And also we were beginning to identify quite unusual pathologies which we'd not really thought of in the same way. We just assumed it was something quite simple and when you looked into it in more detail, we were picking up very, very exciting cases. Um, and it was the, the luxury of being able to spend that time with the material was absolutely fantastic. Um, and we worked very, very closely with colleagues um, from across Bradford, including our radiography department. Um, and then also we have um, Keith and Alan in the centre of the middle um, photograph. Keith is a retired GP, Alan is a retired dentist. So we're bringing in all of their clinical knowledge into the project as we went along. So what did, uh, what did we actually do in practice? Well, having made those selections, the process of 3D digitizing um, each of those elements was down to um, selection of an appropriate method where we could uh, visualize um, some sometimes quite complex objects. Okay. You see here a toe, which is um, uh, a very small object, but we were dealing with things like teeth as well, um, each of which uh, have their inherent problems even if they are showing normal morphology, let alone the sort of um, uh, problems of porosity 
that come about um, through uh, pathological change. So we were using something called a, a laser arm. Uh, you can see that here. We've got complementary methods now in Bradford, such as structured light scanning. But um, we started out with, with the uh, laser arm, which effectively works on the principle of trigonometry. Uh, so um, it sends out a laser stripe, and you've got a video cam camera that captures that, uh, that information, so the return of that laser, and it's on an armature that um, moves around in 3D space, and it, it, together it knows where it is. The varied colour that you see down here at the bottom represents the fact that it, each scan is built up from successive passes of those uh, laser stripes. Okay? In practice, what that means is we had a variety of different skill sets within the project team. We had people that were doing the scanning and we trained up people in London to do the complementary work to that in Bradford. So we had a laser arm based in Bradford and a laser arm that we had based in, in, uh, in London. And as the image shows here, um, each of these elements went through a number of researchers' hands because we had to uh, describe the specimen. Of course, there's no point in doing this work without that metadata, the importance of why that specimen is, is relevant. So the descriptions, the scanning, the texture photography which was going on here, um, which provides the, the um, uh, contrast, as you see in these images, um, relative to uh, the sort of grayscale image that you see at the bottom there, we were able to provide photorealistic um, qualities to our images. But no mean task. Of course, um, we've got a nice quote later on from Forbes about the nature of our project um, as being a sort of pioneer in this field. Um, but a lot of methodological challenges. Big data, as Joe has, has spoken about. Problems of artefacts that we actually create through the scanning process based on the small size of some of these fragments, <coughs> based on the pitting, based on the edges, some of which don't produce a very good laser return. The fact that bone, when broken, exposing that trabeculae, doesn't scan that, very, uh, that well. The fact that the enamel of teeth is quite shiny. And if the depositional environment is such that we have uh, changes in terms of colour, and uh, that can uh, be represented differently as well. The value of it is, of course, it can move around an object, but of course it can only see what you can point that laser at. It can't see around corners, it can't see into the undercut regions of very complex topography on those objects. The photography and the texturing, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, is really uh, a major aspect to what we were trying to achieve in terms of explaining the relevance of these changes to these bones from normal. But initially, we were confined in that pilot project to just dealing with the grayscale image. Okay, we had a, um, a trial viewer that used a proprietary format, which was quite limiting in, in many respects. We therefore complemented that with other approaches, the use of object movies and, and the like. But the texturing process was one borrowed from the discipline of, of visual computing. We had two visual artists, one experienced from the sort of animation gaming field um, and uh, um, and even within uh, and amongst those two visual artists, they, they had uh, varied skills in, in terms of their original training. But what you can see in that top left image is one of the initial um, steps that they had to undertake. Based on the complexity of some of these bones, the broken structure, you can see that um, the laser return um, wasn't always uh, providing complete coverage. We needed to do something called hole filling to enable us to create an entire 3D model without any gaps. Those texture photographs that we showed earlier 
uh, being caught were effectively then translated into these sort of flat surface models, linking the photographs to that 3D geometry such that eventually they could be repainted back on the 3D model itself. The process of texturing, not the sort of texture that we're familiar with conventionally in archaeology. For some of those objects, it was just too complex, and we had to use other methods, such as object movies and the use of CT um, uh, data, which uh, we'll explain in a little bit more detail in a moment. But over to Joe again in terms of what we, what we produced. Okay, so at the outset we wanted to produce something that was quite ambitious and over the course of the project we actually scanned over 1,600 um, bones or fragments of bones that could be pieced back together into 3D models and all of these were textured um, using that photographic technique. We made these available over the internet and we're, we're, we're still uploading these models onto the internet as we speak, um, onto a format that has fully open access. It's got a Commons copyright um, license, which basically means that people can use this in their own research and in their own teaching anywhere in the world, um, as long as they don't modify it or print it out or anything like that. And our idea was really, initially, that we wanted people to be able to use this in lectures um, with their students. We were aware that we were blessed with this fantastic collection in Bradford, but that many institutions did not have the ability to do that. And we thought that for students it would be fantastic to actually have a 3D model that they could manipulate, rather than just a 2D photograph in a book. Uh, because it was on the internet, students would then be able to use this in their own time to study. And more importantly, researchers from around the world can also use these within their research. So over the summer, I was lucky enough to talk about the project to the Peminsa group, which is the Paleopathology Association meeting in South America. So I was over in Buenos Aires um, explaining this to colleagues over there. And we're starting to talk about, could we start to translate this into Spanish so that it has a global reach? Um, so essentially, we've got a virtual learning environment that students and, and um, lecturers can use, but it becomes a research base as well. And suffice to say that even the oldest member of the project team was delighted when presented with the iPad and just using his finger, he could turn that bone around and explore what was going on. So one of the most happy photographs of Keith Manchester that I've, I've, I've ever captured, or that Andy captured this one. Um, so we launched our website um, a couple of years ago and it's still being developed despite the fact the project ended a while ago. We've had continuation money from the university through a project known as Bradford Visualisation that has allowed us to, to continue working on this and update material as we go along. Um, our most recent addition is to the CT data that you can see on the front page of the website. Essentially what people can do is navigate through that system to pull up a single pathological specimen. In this case, you're looking at an Anglo-Saxon example of Pott's disease of the spine, um, evidence of tuberculosis. Um, this example is very, very extreme. I, th I can't remember exactly how many numbers there, um, vertebrae there are. I remember, I think there are 10 vertebrae in total, but the destruction of the pathology has actually taken away four or five of the vertebral bodies, which are on this side. So this should be much more straight. It's causing it an anterior curvature. Um, so you can go online and you can pull up this 3D image and you can manipulate it online in a, a lower resolution information, but having the description and the information regarding the age and the sex of the individual alongside it. Before you do that, you actually have um, an option with the pathological description at the bottom. Very, very often we had conditions or, or elements with more than one pathology present, so we had coexisting pathologies. If you look in somebody's teeth, there's a reasonable chance that they're going to have um, dental cavities, but they may also have another dental problem as well, and a lot of these happen uh, hand in hand. Um, but essentially you have the option to look at that model online, or you can actually download it with a higher resolution version that you can actually manipulate on um, software known as MeshLab, which is um, free to download. 
Um, the download files are quite large, they're normally coming as zip files um, and we, we make sure that everybody is aware of A, how they can cite the resource so, so that um, credit is due, but also what they can and can't do it. It is free to use to anybody, but we can't permit 3D printing and this is partly because of the importance of the ethical aspects of what we're doing, particularly in relation to the more recent material that's curated by the Royal College of Surgeons that is less than 100 years old and falls under the Human Tissue Act. So we need to think very carefully about what should and shouldn't be done with this data. In terms of um, supplementing this, we actually um, also scanned a whole host of radiographs, initially in the From Cemetery to Clinic, project, we scanned the um, Joss Anderson archive of clinical radiographs of leprosy. For digitised diseases, we then scanned plain film radiographs that we had of our pathological specimens and we took new radiographs to supplement that to aid in our diagnosis and our description as we went along and to also make those available to people. In recognition of the fact that, of course, some of those conditions um, go far deeper than the sort of superficial uh, observations we can make of the, of the outer cortex of the bone, we also um, had collaborations with the local hospital at um, Pinderfield, um, so Mid York's uh, NHS Trust, um, but also our project partners down here in London were able to uh, go and do the same at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. So we had our outpatients visiting our out of hours um, going through the CT scanners um, at these uh, institutions. And for the very fine detail, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment, we also used um, a collaboration with Smith and Nephew in York using their micro CT um, before we were able to get micro CT in Bradford ourselves. Um, both techniques uh, provide huge amounts of data. Data which is available certainly from the CT, the, uh, from the medical sense, in very specific formats. That DICOM format which is used for medical imaging. Um, but we had the expertise of uh, Researchers very conversant with 3D, 3D data uh, from archaeology. So imagine the, the sort of geophysical prospection data that we also collect these days in three dimensions. They were treating and handling the same um, CT data in a, in a very similar sort of manner. So they were converting it, converting it into those 3D coordinates that we could then um, save in, in a variety of formats and produce either um, a surface model to visually reconstruct that, uh, that element or to actually extract a, a, um, separate views from it. And again, using um, web-based um, uh, dissemination of that. We've got a nice example here that shows why in relation to um, collections from the Royal College of Surgeons, and if you can imagine the, the, the sort of bounding box here is actually uh, a, a perspex box uh, um, containing a wet specimen um, from the Royal College of Surgeons, and it happens to be um, showing the soft tissue as well as the osseous material from um, an osteochondroma, osteo chondrosarcoma of the knee, where you can see, um, again, the value of this work uh, using CT as well as, uh, as a complementary technique to the surface scanning that we were doing elsewhere. This is that example I mentioned that uh, illustrates why um, the micro CT was uh, particularly valuable to us. You saw very early on an example um, of a neoplastic condition, uh, a cancer, um, in an individual from Wolverhampton, from 19th century Wolverhampton. This is a rib from that same individual, and you can see those spicules of bone, that very fine detail, uh, only picked up uh, through the use of, of micro CT. So we're trying to use complementary methods. 
We're trying to use innovative method, methods that work with bone elements, that work in reconstructing um, related elements. And we have an example showing how, of course, you can reconstruct a, um, uh, uh, a series of elements together. In fact, this is from um, the Royal London Hospital site, uh, excavated by Museum of London Archaeology, where you see portions here, fragments of a mandible, a lower jaw, found um, that uh, has certain discoloration to the surface. This is a textured 3D scanned model that has um, uh, then been virtually um, re, uh, realigned. Okay, we're able to match the sawn fragments together. The varied staining is because they come from different portions of that deposition environment from the Royal London Hospital. So they show, of course, aspects of what this project is capable of doing. And in fact, a, a large part of that work with MOLA was thinking about um, this content as part of wider stakeholder engagement. So we were able to contribute some information to the um, online resource, uh, that sort of backstory to the Doctor's Dissection and Resurrection Men exhibition, which was a big success at um, the Museum of London. But of course our other uh, project partner, the Royal College of Surgeons, um, had similar interest in working with us to present material to the wider public. And this is an example of John Hunter's original collection, an example showing the infective, uh, the, the changes um, uh, relating to infection post um, ballistic trauma. Okay, this, this is a, a very famous example of that ballistic trauma, as you can see, um, uh, that John Hunter then later dissected. As Joe mentioned, it's very much an ongoing picture, ongoing work reassociating some of those elements, ongoing work trying to ingest more content for that web delivery. But it wasn't just the web delivery and the uh, creation of that web gel based um, uh, um, delivery that we were working on. And although, uh, as Joe has, has rightly pointed out, this was very much seen as a born digital resource, Ultimately, we will be looking to include one or two choice examples that we will allow people to 3D print. And we did some innovative work, and I'm very happy to allow people to pass these 3D prints around, um, uh, showing the, the sort of level of detail that we can capture from these surface scans um, that we can then turn into physical models again. So it's, it's that life cycle um, uh, perpetuated yet again in terms of the importance of preserving these very fragile and very important specimens. Part of the legacy goes further, and, and some of you may be familiar with this chap on the right-hand side. If you've been to the new Stonehenge Visitor Centre, this is the chap that greets you. He is from the Neolithic Winterbourne Stoke Barrow um, at, uh, as part of that Stonehenge landscape. And Andy Holland, one of the researchers on digitised diseases, is shown there doing the um, initial 3D scanning, um, which we then turned into a 3D print. And Oscar Nielsen there in, in the centre um, did a facial reconstruction that you can now see as the general public. So I'm going to um, let Jo uh, say <coughs> something about um, the sort of uptake as a, a teaching resource. Okay, so we mentioned right at the beginning that over the summer we've been um, very lucky to have a huge amount of investment into our area. Um, we actually moved across campus as a department in August and September and the Biological Anthropology Research Centre is part of an integrated learning centre that focuses around the human body from modern anatomy 
pharmacy and um, right the way through to the archaeological specimens. Um, just this morning, what I should have been doing this morning when I was sat on a train, and thankfully my lovely colleague Julia Beaumont um, did this for me, was actually use some of the osteological examples that we have in Bradford to teach our physiotherapy students from the School of Health what conditions look like underneath the skin because they never get to see that and they do um, return um, teaching with my students. As part of that we've got a newly um, refurbished lab um, which is depicted here. We actually took these photographs just yesterday afternoon. That's a group of my master's students working on their skeletal material. But we've been able to use a large touch screen monitor to integrate the use of the website into our teaching. And for the last few weeks, I've been working with my undergraduate students, teaching them the basics of paleopathology. And always after we've done the introduction, there's a group of students manipulating different objects on the screen, exploring far more specimens in that lab than I could ever get out of the store and enabling to look at those that I think are too fragile to actually bring out for teaching. One of the most amazing things for us is actually looking at the scale of it. So you can see me just holding um, a toe bone that's affected by gout next to the image that we've put on the screen. So you're actually able to blow that up and look at it in much greater detail. Of course, the bigger you go, you do begin to lose the resolution after a critical point. But it does allow us to look at these in, in far greater detail and to manipulate them and turn them round. And at the bottom, I'm talking about this case with um, Jazz, one of my master's students. Last year, she did a dissertation on gout, and that's one of the specimens she actually included, looking at evidence of gout in the medieval period. But it's far more than what we can do in Bradford. It's actually about what we can do for everybody else. And this, we know that this is, um, resource is being used by researchers around the world. And recently, there was a, a, an article published in Forbes uh, magazine by Christina Kilgrove, who actually said that we are doing the, most, uh, the first and most extensive digitization project in bioarchaeology to date, just because of the sheer number of specimens that we're doing. So rather than just doing one or two small focused specimens, we've actually tried to get as much as we can into that project. And we know that the uptake, uptake of this resource is global. These are some of the statistics of use on the website. We had over 13,000 unique visitors to the website in 2014. Um, over 16,000 in 2013. I think a lot of that was around the launch of the project that those people first came in. But it's continuing. We're getting new people month on month. And importantly for us is looking at the, the colour coding on that um, map on the far side of the slide. Um, the darker the colour, the more hits we're getting on that resource. And one of the big hotspots is North America, where they have huge, huge bioanthropology programmes looking at human remains, but very, very few skeletal collections to actually base that research on, because much of the Native American material is being repatriated to Native American groups and often reburied and therefore not being used in the same way. Um, so although they have small amounts of teaching material, they don't have the scale that we do. So for them, it's really benefiting what they can do with their students rather than relying on the traditional photographs. Just pass over back to Andy. Really, just to sum up part of the reason that you've had this sort of comic double act here up on stage this uh, this evening is, is of course, the, 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 the fact that it has been a huge project, a project involving um, major project partners um, within the UK, major uh, contributions from associate partners, but a very wide uh, project team, very large project team, spanning quite a number of different disciplines from the sort of um, visual computing end of things right through to the biological anthropology and all bringing com complementary skills into the project. Um, so we were uh, lucky uh, midway through the project to get to, uh, at least a large portion of that team together at, um, uh, in the Crystal Gallery, as they call it, at the Royal College of Surgeons for a bit of a, uh, a meet uh, um, and to share ideas. But as, as I, I've alluded to, it is something that is very much um, a part of what we like to do in Bradford. We've continued this as a, a legacy in, in other areas through other projects um, in uh, continuing the work in biological anthropology but working with other animal hard tissues as well that sort of uh, helps uh, in terms of customs and border control where of course things like um, uh, 
rhino horn or elephant ivory need to be characterised um, and so uh, the legacy there really is building on a life's work of, of Dr Sonia O'Connor. Um, we've uh, had a project which is now at its halfway point called Fragmented Heritage, a £2 million project funded by HRC, where um, we've just launched um, our Fossil Finder um, website, which is a crowdsourced piece of science. Um, working in, in Kenya, working with three-dimensional uh, landscape scale studies, looking with Louise Leakey at material um, uh, from the Turkana Basin and trying to get the public involved uh, and engaged in, the, in that material. And as Joe mentioned, the, um, uh, the sort of unifying aspect of this work in three dimensions is um, something called Bradford Visualisation, which receives some high funding uh, through HEFKI um, uh, and allows us to, to sort of continue this work. So it's extending an, uh, the range of skills and kits that we have available to these sorts of projects. But once again, it's a, a huge project and a testament to a huge uh, amount of involvement from very many quarters, mentioned the, the, the wider sort of advisory team in, in terms of people like uh, the late Don Altner, um, in whose name the, the project is now dedicated, but also the funding bodies, JISC with that foresight to include um, uh, us in that 2011-2012 uh, e-content programme has allowed this uh, resource to become available. And of course, what they're interested in is very much that level of open access that we get from um, uh, throwing, throwing this open in that sort of creative commons uh, license sense. So um, I think that's really what we wanted to share with you today. If anyone is, is particularly interested in learning more about the website, more about that resource, we have one or two of these little leaflets here. But do get on and, and have a try yourselves by visiting www.digitizeddiseases.org and do share that with your friends and colleagues. Many thanks for having us.